I'm joined by Michelle Hembry. I'm Jack Howell. Michelle Hembry is our new second horn player. And um, I think it's going to be really interesting to anyone who wants to be you to hear the war stories. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I've got to say, you're off to a flying start. Um, I think uh, the thing I've enjoyed most is when we played those Beethoven piano concerti. Oh, yeah. With that was Rudolph fun. Buchbinder. And uh, you and Steve, it was just immaculate. Thank you. And I can remember your audition because I was on your committee. <laughs> and always after auditions, I go into my Duquesne rep class and, and I've kind of got a, a moral of the story. And what I told the rep class was that we just had a horn audition. And that as the rounds progressed, the playing became more and more accurate. In the preliminary rounds, we heard quite a few yard sales. Yeah, <laughs> that's typical, but, I think. <laughs> and, I, and I said, the moral of the story is to find the primary failure mode of your instrument and eliminate it. Yeah. Is now, if you hadn't done so, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Is that something that was baked into your playing from early training, or is that something you had to achieve at a later date? My teachers always said that I learned the horn backwards, uh -huh. and I always struggled more with the musicality aspect more than the technicality. Uh -huh. So even when I was really young, just starting around 10, I always had just the natural technique, which a lot of people learn the other way. It doesn't come as naturally. Mm. So I was lucky that that came more naturally. Everybody's but... going to be really, really <laughs> disappointed to hear that. <laughs> but I was told my playing's robotic. You have to work on the musical side. So that developed for me much later. But even throughout college, uh, my primary teacher, teacher was Randy Gardner. Uh -huh. And I remember doing accuracy exercises in studio with him where Everybody would play one eight two, and the minute that you missed a note, played a wrong dynamic, anything, you're out. And so it was just a competition. And he would also do recording simulations. So take an excerpt from like Sibelius five, uh -huh. and you go until people don't miss notes. So there's more to winning an audition than not missing notes, but it is mm -hmm. important for advancement to prove that you it are is. accurate. It is. Because on, on one hand, people have won auditions here having made a mistake. Yes. But if, if a horn player, uh, you know, misses the, the, the high stuff in Held and Laban, you know, we don't think, well, that person's under a lot of stress. I'm mm -hmm. sure when we're, we're broadcasting live from Berlin, it'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you see, you, you said started at ten. You started violin at five. Yes. How? What from that? Do you think? Do you think that early start in music was a factor? Yeah, I do think so because I already knew how to read music and was taking private lessons. So mm -hmm. my parents were very smart in getting my sister and I and my younger brother eventually played the piano um, involved with private teachers yeah. and they never went in with the goal of let's make a professional musician they just wanted us to have well-rounded extracurricular activities that weren't just sports um, and my mom had played instruments growing up as well so yeah. it definitely helped already knowing the basics before playing horn and yeah. i was involved in youth orchestra and band um, so i had that influence you all know, throughout my childhood when you when you when you say parents i immediately think of your bio and um, you know the the violin and the competitions and and I could just see a lot of parental involvement in that oh yeah I think it's I, and I think it's commendable that they your first your first horn teacher was principal in Boise Philharmonic yeah and so funny story actually because uh, a couple years into my violin playing probably around the time I was in like middle school, our current teacher had moved. And so we started studying with a violinist who had openings and she was in the fill. A lot yeah. of them taught privately. And her husband was actually David Saunders, the principal horn. So normally he did not take on kids, mm -hmm. but I needed a teacher for you horn a, too. And she said, okay, just go and do, I had to do a little audition for him. And I think I started studying with him. Yeah, by, by the time I was in high school at least. Um, 
and that was a really great experience yeah. because I got to attend college master classes at Boise State and see the guest artists he would bring in and yeah. just be around a higher level of playing with the college students there instead of just a high school band. So it was a really great exposure yeah. for me and he was also a wonderful private teacher and pushed me very hard. Well, kudos to your parents because so many of the students that I get, their parents thought, well, you know, I'm not sure Michelle's going to stick with it. Let's just have this college kid teacher because it's only 20 bucks an hour and, you know, it'd yeah, be fine. Yeah, they actually had me try, try some lessons with college teachers and I said, I don't like them. Yeah. So they listened to me also when I said, I don't want to study with this person. I want to keep looking for a different teacher. Yeah. So, but also if we started something we, we were not allowed to quit so everything we did like my sister played violin through the end of high school she didn't want to by the end mm -hmm. but there's no quitters well, <laughs> so. mom and dad good job so everybody's going to want to you know there are several things that i that i want to cover but this being youtube uh, people are going to want the war stories so <laughs> so Tell me about your Pittsburgh Symphony audition. What I'd like to know is how the audition experience went. I'd like to know how your experience in auditions in general has been. Do you perceive it as fair? Do you perceive it as equitable? Uh, and I'd also like to know how you prepare for auditions. Sure. So I actually, I've taken a lot of auditions actually, um, a lot of them within the last couple of years since pretty much things started coming back after COVID. That's mm -hmm. when I really like hit the ground running. Like, and okay, I lost time. I got to try and win a job here because I lost a couple of years of audition experience in my early 20s, which is kind of a formative years for a young person. And trying you've gone to, right up the ladder. Uh, kind of. <laughs> so I, I did a lot of regional auditions when I was in college mm -hmm. and I won principal in the Kentucky Symphony, which was great. It's regional per mm -hmm. service, but it's right there yeah. near school. So really good place to gain some experience yeah. and make a lot of mistakes uh, and figure out the ropes a little bit. Yeah. Um, and there's a great freelancing scene in Cincinnati as well. So I'm really glad I went to school there because I was able to integrate and get that real world playing experience, yeah. which I think really helps with confidence especially mm -hmm. in auditions but kept doing that during school didn't have a lot of audition success during school but I wasn't taking too many of them so mm -hmm. what I really found post COVID is I had the most success when I would take several in a row so if I could do like three or four in the span of a couple months mm -hmm. then okay maybe the first one's all right but by the third or the fourth one that's where I'm really hitting my stride and feeling confident so part of it was just trying to take anything feasible, but I was also being a little bit picky with auditions because I was already acting principal in Fort Wayne and mm -hmm. was trying to win a, another job uh, before COVID hit. And after COVID, I did not go back to Fort Wayne. I was just freelancing. Mm -hmm. So during the freelancing careers when I was really, really taking auditions um, and I was looking at jobs where they were big jobs like this, but more so section positions because I personally felt that I would have a higher chance of winning a section job than a principal job necessarily. So mm -hmm. I'd had success at smaller principal auditions, but I had a better track record at making it further for section jobs. So said, I don't know. It worked out. But You said something important that I, that, I, that I think different people do it different ways. But when you said, I took a lot of auditions... That's similar to what I did preparing for my audition here, not necessarily taking auditions, but playing for a lot of people, mm -hmm. simulating the audition so many times by the time the audition actually happened that it just kind of felt like another day. Sure. So being able to act, take the actual auditions, I think that's, that's yeah, a good Yeah, and I actually... I never played a ton of mocks. Uh, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are big proponents of that, but personally for me, my work schedule was so crazy trying to make money as a freelancer that I didn't have a lot of free time to play mocks. And also you have to have face time left yeah. too. So you have to be really smart about, I have a heavy playing load this week, but I also need to practice rep for this audition. So yeah. just managing lists in the sense of uh, like I do the Randy Garter method. If he separates it into A, B, and C, 
A being things that like these are already pretty good. You don't need to keep mm -hmm. touching it. B, you should probably hit once every couple of days, but then a C is is every day. And that mm -hmm. list evolves and changes yeah. as you prepare for the audition, but it helps give structure Absolutely. to and prioritize what needs to be done. Yeah. So I definitely got more efficient as that, the busier I was and the more auditions I was taking because I was not just taking second horn auditions. Yeah. I took a couple principal horn auditions last year, some third horn. So the lists aren't always the same, but if it was a job that was attractive to me, I didn't care about having to yeah. work up more rep. Eventually well, there'll I'm, be repetition. I'm glad you but. landed here. Uh, so we are going to talk about the PSO audition. <laughs> and, but I think I can do this quickly. You talk about the ABC list. Mm -hmm. And something that I've advocated getting ready for an audition is what I call a one-shot drill, where you, have, you record yourself and basically you, you imagine that it's the audition day. You go through all the, the things you pretend just got up in the hotel, blah, blah, blah. Make it as real as possible. Turn on the recorder. Record the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Front to back. Take a break. Have lunch. Listen to it, make notes. Yeah. Only practice the stuff that's bad. Yeah, that's rinse, another great method. Rinse, and, repeat. Yeah, and recording yourself is, is very, very helpful. And I feel like by the time I won this job, I was my own worst critic, worst and best critic. I know my yes. playing more than uh, peers for mocks. Um, and some of those are grain of salt situations. So recording yeah. is uh, really, really helpful in those situations, but you also mentioned the visualization aspect, mm -hmm. which I also was brought up in, in that school of thought. So even before this audition, like I went online, I looked up pictures of the hall because I'd never been here. Like I look up yeah. who's in the section, you kind of imagine like, oh, like my name would look good there. So things like that yeah. where you're trying to mentally prepare, but also one of my former teachers, she had taken um, the associate mm -hmm. horn audition. Liz. Yeah, and she, she ended up winning the Cincinnati job and uh, right. stay, ended up there, but she had told me before the final, like, I don't know if they still do this, but they had me sit in the seat, in, in the actual seat in the back. So yeah. she had told me before, which is helpful because all the other rounds were not in the second horn seat. So I was glad I had a little bit of warning that I would be sitting right. back there next to Bill because they yeah. told me right before I walked on stage. but. And I've learned I said, that. Oh, I, I knew that already. <laughs> I've just learned a ton from sitting. I've just learned a ton listening to Bill. You, oh yeah. Guys. Yeah. Same. So okay. So that was that was the detour. Now it's you're, you've arrived in Pittsburgh. Uh, you played. Uh, I assume you played a preliminary. Yes. Right. So. Yeah, the prelim was very short. I think it was about five excerpts, and we were closer to the front of the stage. And I think the committee was was also really close. So. That's what I liked about this audition is you guys heard us from multiple vantage points throughout the process. Mm -hmm. So I felt good about the prelim. It, it was clean and that's kind of all you can hope for at that point is you're not going to show off anything crazy is just play a solid round and yeah, that's, uh, that's see the rule. what don't, happens. Don't disqualify yourself. Yeah, exactly. So felt good about the prelim and then my semi was the same day and it was it was decently long but screen comes down here for semis which is interesting but it doesn't anymore we just oh changed. okay we just changed yeah that. i i'm a proponent of keeping the screen up but it <laughs> it worked fine in this situation exactly. but i've been in situations before where you scratch your head like oh you know, I'm the youngest one here. Maybe that didn't help me or things like that. Or they're looking at your resume. I tried being so. the oldest one. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So, yeah, screen was down. And I, I described it to friends since as it felt almost kind of like a master class because Bill was so involved and at the front mm -hmm. of the stage and mm -hmm. uh, I was getting asked to replay things, which I always take as a good sign in the audition if the committee is willing to hear you play more, it doesn't mean that they don't like you. They're yeah. interested in seeing yeah. what else you can do. That means they see something. So yeah, I think that was maybe like a 30-ish minute round, but a lot more excerpts and then a concerto exposition at the start as well. And it was just nitpicky things of play certain things louder or stylistic differences. So testing me to see if I could adapt to instruction. And it worked, I guess. Louder, so, so. You're kidding. <laughs> exactly. I didn't understand 
how loud they actually meant with the louder, probably until I played the trial eventually, but even in the final round then, that was, like I said earlier, in, in the back next to Bill, um, yeah. and then Hanek is there as well, and that also included some, some sight reading. It wasn't really sight reading of uh, little duet excerpts, mm -hmm. but some of those were already on the list, so there was maybe one that was true sight reading, and those were with Bill, and he was definitely just pushing my limits uh, in both directions, in the loud and the softs, but the, the soft was probably the true struggle for me because I've never played that soft before in my life. And Bill's got and this he, thing where he can, he can just... can whisper. He can just like, but it's focused. It's like one yes. lip cell is vibrating. Yeah, and that, that was something that I figured out, I'm gonna have to get used to this really fast, but I, I held it together, I guess, and, and the louds, I remember we were doing a passage from Mahler 1, and they just kept saying louder, 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 and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't do much louder, so but that's, not necessarily that's how they would want you to play it in context, but they want to see if you can do it, if prompted, so I think just that mindset in, in, in the final was like, well, I have nothing to lose, yeah. and that was my first big, big final ever. That was my first section round, so <laughs> just had to pretend like I'd done it before and like fake it, even if you don't feel confident about it, you kind of don't have another choice in yeah. that situation. So. Yeah. That's, that's great. Now, we might get to some of the other auditions, but there's one thing that, looking at your bio, I wanted to ask about, and you mentioned balancing the work and all that stuff. You've got an unusual amount of business experience. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's worth mentioning because players, young players are often told, no plan B. Mm -hmm. That's like a battle cry, no plan B. Yeah. That if you're not totally committed to plan A, you won't do the necessary work. But I can think of a lot of people who had a solid plan B. Yeah, I, I know a couple of musicians that yeah. also have the music background. So. I went to the business school at University of Cincinnati because CCM is part of the same campus, so yeah. it makes it easier than other places mm -hmm. to double major. So I got a degree in industrial management. And my parents, I come from an engineering family and mm -hmm. chemical engineer and chemist, and my sister's a chemical engineer. So, yeah. The that, was my, that was my dad's plan for me to be a chemist. Yeah, they never had a plan for me to be one thing or the other, but I think by the end of high school they could tell it was trending towards yeah. that I want to do music, but they were looking at, well, yeah, it'd be a good idea to have a backup, but all, not just for if you fail, but they would say if you get burnt out in your career ever, then you could always stop playing. I just and think it takes, it takes some of the, the desperation out of it. That's what they, they agreed with that too, and I would say... <laughs> I don't regret doing it, but it made school a lot harder, and I would not recommend it if you aren't very dedicated yeah. to at least the instrument portion. You could, and, and, I could get away with things in business school, not studying for tests and whatever, but right. you can't get away with, with not practicing. So horn was always my priority. It's just how do you, how do you prioritize yeah. the rest of your time with the workload, and it did take me five years to graduate. It would have been impossible to do it in four, yeah. but yeah, there was a, a lot of extra work that sometimes I wonder, oh, I could have spent this time doing something that more helps me on the horn, but I don't, I don't think long term it really impacted me. It more became when I graduated, I, I was working for GE Aviation mm -hmm. in Cincinnati, so mm -hmm. yeah, not the desperation in the sense that, you know, I was getting paid a salary and every summer instead of going to festivals, outside of one festival I worked yeah. at internships and they'll pay you 25 bucks an hour to and there, <laughs> not and do and much there's, so. and there's, you know and there's something else about the internships um, I think you've got for your age as a musician you've got an, an unusual way of fitting in with people and I'll tell you what I mean Bill told this story about when you were on, you're on trial Oh no, I don't know this story. It, it's, it is it is it is it is absolutely perfect. And he said that in rehearsal they were playing and and, and he he came in a, a bar early. 
on something and he turned to you and said, was that right? And you said, absolutely. <laughs> and all I can tell you. Boss is always right. <laughs> I, can tell you, I can't tell you how much, how much that pleased me, how well that was played. And you just don't learn to volley like that sitting in a practice room. Yeah, yeah, that's why it's, it is helpful to have the experience in all of the different fields of industry I did just because you learn how to just work people. with all different, yeah. yeah, all different kinds of people, but also all different management styles too, so. You got the suits, you got the hard hats. Yeah, exactly, and like I worked in banking, manufacturing, uh, uh, polyurethanes, so <laughs> really, really broad yeah. spectrum um, of industries, but some of that was, you know, I felt that, okay, I always want to win a job, but what if I don't do that? Then mm -hmm. what industry do I actually like? Yeah. And I, I didn't love my corporate job at GE, but it, it forces you, again, to use your time efficiently. Yeah. And I'd done this over yeah. the summers where I usually had jobs where I could flex my hours and I would get in early and work like 7 to 3.30, work through lunch, go home and like I'm warming up for the first time at 4 p.m. So yeah. then you have to be really smart about how are you spending that time in the practice room and how are you using the rests in between and it's it's mentally exhausting and to do that and i'd only done that for three month stints before over the summer and then i'd go back to school but when i was doing it full-time corporate yeah. that's when it hit me oh this this is not sustainable if i actually am gonna win a job um and college and kids can learn from that you know, yeah. because, yeah, so you've got to go to English and you've got to go to math and all that stuff. That doesn't mean that you, you can't be a missile with your instrument. Yeah, exactly. It's just finding the time or b building the time, you know. There's a lot of times where, you know, even after I was working at Fort Wayne or at Cincinnati Symphony, you know, people are, I'm going to go out to drinks. I'm going to go do this, this, this. It's like, well... I have a rehearsal or in the, earlier in the morning, or I have an audition next week. Mm -hmm. You just have to make those tougher choices of yeah. how to spend your time, and it's not always fun. But. There's, and the, the, there's, the, the next thing I want to ask <clears throat> you is, and I don't want to lead the witness with this, but I think it's, it would be irresponsible not to talk about it. Pittsburgh Symphony was founded in 1896. You're the first woman member of the horn section in history. And I think you're only the second woman member of the brass section in history. Yeah. Without, without, I have no idea what you're going to say about it, but you must have thoughts about that. In a, in a sense, it's like, oh, wow, this, this has happened to me? That's so cool. But then the flip side of that is, how has this not happened before? I, mm -hmm. you know, in this day and age, it feels like nobody should be the first of any certain demographic mm -hmm. to be in a job. So I'm excited about it though, because that means that change has been happening over mm -hmm. the years because it wasn't a blind audition and I'm still in the job. So clearly mm -hmm. people here didn't have a problem hiring a woman and I also think it's the problem of you know the last horn audition before mine was Mark's in mm -hmm. 2014 so it's also a turnover thing of these jobs sometimes aren't vacated for a really really long time mm -hmm. and historically there's been more problems in the past than there are now with women being hired but I think it's also just an education issue of when kids are younger, sometimes girls are steered towards more feminine instruments and away yeah. from brass. And I oh, think, Michelle, why don't you play the flute? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, or the violin. Yeah. But um, I think that narrative is slowly changing as people are becoming more yeah. educated and teachers are learning that, you know, it's not, oh, it's not this girl has little lungs and she can't hold the instrument. Mm -hmm. They're learning that that, that doesn't matter mm -hmm. for a kid. A kid will learn how to adapt and that's physically not true. So I think given time uh, with teachers in elementary schools that are have mm -hmm. more understanding mm -hmm. and aren't gendering instruments, then you start seeing more girls that go to college um, for mm -hmm. uh, music and eventually that'll leak into more professionals and I think we're already starting 
to see that. I mean, even in my horn studio at CCM, it was about 50-50 split mm -hmm. for male and female, but I know at Eastman, it's, it's largely a female studio. So you're already starting to see that change. It's just that has to change professionally also. And I do think there's still some of that older mindset of this is a boys club mm -hmm. and they don't want a lady around, which I haven't got in that sense here at all. I haven't, yes, having sat on audition committees, I have not ever heard anyone say anything like, well, a woman just can't produce the volume we need or anything, I've never heard. I mean, yeah, I, there was three women in the horn section in Cincinnati when mm. I was uh, playing there on a contract last year, and one of them I know personally was told, you can't play loud because you're small. <laughs> mm. She's one of the loudest players I've ever heard, so. Yeah. It's just uh, misconceptions that unfortunately can leak into a professional environment, but I do think that is changing for the better and the yeah. preconceived notions are going away. Well, well said. Now, I, I wanted to ask you about another thing on your bio because you're clearly outdoorsy, you're clearly athletic. I've long maintained that while there certainly are exceptions, in general, a high resistance to physical stress correlates with a high resistance to psychological stress. Do you, is that anything that you would agree with, just being? Yeah, being I guess fit, I, I haven't, I haven't thought about it in that way specifically, well, but, again, but I guess you're, you're, you're young. I'm always, I've always been a competitor though, even if yeah. it wasn't in music, I played competitive volleyball year round in high yeah. school. Yeah. Um, and so that was a big part of my mentality also is, you know, kind of viewing horn through almost a sports lens. And that's kind of how one mm -hmm. of my college teachers related it to a mental toughness in relation to sports. So I think whether or not I was conscious of that in high school, it definitely mm -hmm. ekes into your mentality of how do you deal with tough situations, how do you deal with tough mm -hmm. competitions, and kind of just saying, okay, well, yeah. I got to do it. And Gardner was big on you should have a personal mantra mm -hmm. in your head that you, you can say out loud if you want before an audition. So it, it sometimes it might sound stupid, but it's just for you. And I mine before this one, I think I was like, I can do this. I'm strong. I'm brave. I'm not scared. Yeah. And you say it to yourself and it might feel silly, but in those moments of right before you're about to go on stage and it's really stressful, it can help center you and yeah. calm you down. Yeah. So yeah, simil similar to the sports mindset, but yeah, I do think it helps give you that competitive edge if you are thinking in that way and you're mentally tough yeah. and, and blocking out those, the negative self-talk. Before my audition, I remember, I, uh, this is just one of those little things that stuck in my head talking to Michael uh, Riznik. He was talking about an audition that he had taken, and um, he said, I played great. Just mm -hmm. with that exact inflection, I played great. And so, for some reason, I just kept saying that to myself. Like, I had already played great. Yeah. You know? So now, I don't want to keep you too long. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that you think I should have? I don't know. I guess the one thing I would want to talk about is like college uh -huh. selection process is a lot of people uh, or teachers want you to go, go to the biggest school, go to the big name, go to Juilliard, mm -hmm. whatever. And I was looking at schools like that, but I guess the most important thing for me was finding a teacher that you are going to like mm -hmm. for four years and somebody that knows how to push you in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky to have that because I was in an environment that was really supportive, but also my teachers had high standards and that's, that's how I thrived in college. So I guess people looking at school or if they're getting a master's or wh whatever, 
I think the teacher fit is the most important would, part of that. Would you say that, that, that those college years were the making of you, or would you say it was early professional experience? I would say mostly college, actually, because you're still figuring out how to play the horn then. Yeah. You, you know what you know from high school, but then the world becomes much, much bigger yeah. when you get to college and you realize these are all the things that I don't know and need to work on, and it takes years to, to craft that. and. I think the pro early professional experience is also really important, but without the foundation of what I had in college, I, w I wouldn't have gotten to that point. Super. You have a you have a especially memorable golf shot. Oh, I I got a par on a par three once. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's a big golfer. So. Yeah. Well, Michelle, thank you very much. Once again, wonderful to have you here. Uh, but just. Uh, just uh, just delighted to, to listen to you play, and thanks for taking the time. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. And so I don't have to do any editing. Uh, if any of you guys uh, feel like subscribing to see future videos, that would be cool. Thanks, Michelle. All right. Thanks. <laughs>